Make the choice to begin anywhere in your life, and the journey has started. And along the way, be inspired. Listen to the stories by joining the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, on The Journey. I'm Dr. Wayne Frederick. My guest today is Mike Espy, former Secretary of Agriculture and Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate in Mississippi. Election day is just around the corner, and one of the sons of Howard University will be on the ballot. He is the first African-American candidate to run for United States Senate in the state of Mississippi, and he will share the story of how Howard University has made an impact in his life and in his political career. Hello, my name is Dr. Wayne Frederick. My guest today on The Journey is Mike Espy, former Secretary of Agriculture and Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate in Mississippi. Welcome, uh, Secretary. How are you? Doing well, Mr. President. Thank you so much, and thank you for this opportunity. Oh, absolutely. Oh, my, my pleasure. So let's jump right in. You ran in yes. 2018, um, garnered some 47% of the vote in Mississippi. Uh, obviously, you ran a very good race. What is different about today in 2020 than back then? Well, the first thing is that we have more time. Uh, your viewers should know that I did. I ran in um, 2018, but the incumbent who had the office fell ill, and he resigned in March of that same year, and the election was in November. So by the time we decided to run, we could stand up a campaign, we could raise the money, we could choose the staff. We only had about six months to run. So the entirety of my Senate race, the last race in the nation, only about six months, but we still got 47% of the vote. Oh, that's excellent. And now you have more time, obviously, but what about the infrastructure? I think most of, our, most of my viewers probably do not have a contemporary notion of Mississippi. And well, why don't you paint for them a picture of what the electorate is like in Mississippi today? Well, in 2020, the uh, population of Mississippi is 60% uh, white and 40% black. So right there, you know, we have a, a great basis to, uh, to move from because we have more black voters per capita than any state in the nation. And so therefore, uh, my challenge on the white side, uh, we have less of a threshold to get white votes because we have so many African-American uh, here to vote. So my challenge is just to get them out. And how? In, in 2018, I got 99% of the black vote. Right. So when they come, they'll vote for me, very likely, but only 32.5% actually showed up. I got you. So we, that's our job is to lift that turnout at least three or four more percent. So mobilizing the vote is, is, is clearly an issue. Now, given the pandemic what, uh, and the fact that people may be hesitant to come out, what are the laws and, and regulations in Mississippi around early voting, absentee voting, mail-in voting, as we've been hearing this national discourse? What's unique about the, those, um, sit, that situation in Mississippi? Well, it's Mississippi. <laughs> so I, I first say what you would expect is that uh, our voting laws are, are, not, are not that modern. You know, they are harking back to, a, to an earlier period, and there is some voter suppression in Mississippi. But one thing that uh, we've taken advantage of is that voting has already started. Here in Mississippi, beginning September 21st, if you are age 65 or older, you can vote in person. Or if you're disabled, or you can prove that you won't be in your county on election day, you can also vote in person. So uh, we've just been getting the message out to all of those who fit within uh, who are eligible uh, just to do that. And uh, we've seen long lines already for those who are 65 waiting to vote, uh, not risking the pandemic, voting now, and they're voting at our urging. Okay. Now, I, I would imagine that while mobilizing the African-American vote is clearly a, a, a sound strategy, when you uh, head to the halls of Congress, you're representing all the citizens of Mississippi. Yes. Uh, what about the appeal in the white community? What, what is your platform to appealing to those in the white community? Well, yes, you know, we will get black votes, but uh, we cannot win with black votes alone, nor should we. So here in Mississippi, we believe we're going to need at least 
22% of the white vote. And uh, our latest polling shows that we're right now at 20. And so we're appealing to them on the same uh, issues that we're appealing to everyone. Uh, Mississippi, um, when, it, when we look at healthcare outcomes, we're number 50. So diabetes, heart disease, uh, hypertension, obesity. So we just tell everybody that uh, we want to continue the Affordable Care Act. Within the Affordable Care Act, we want to make sure that Medicaid expansion can be adopted in Mississippi. We're one of 13 states that, that we don't have that. Uh, we certainly want to keep the protections for those with pre-existing illnesses to be covered by their insurance. So, I mean, white and black, uh, they all, these issues are resonated with them. And then I talk about the difference my candidacy makes in 2020 as we go forward in the third decade of this 21st century. Uh, we used to have a flag of Mississippi with a Confederate emblem on it, you know? The state legislature took that flag down, Mr. President. They didn't even wait until the referendum on November 3rd. So this uh, just demonstrates a thirst for change in Mississippi. Mm. They want, uh, we have a new flag, they want a new senator. They want someone who is dynamic, inclusive, uh, representative of a diverse outlook in Mississippi, someone who will be accessible, available to everyone, uh, irrespective of age, race, income, sexual orientation, gender, I'll be the center for everyone. And that message is, uh, is being heard. Let's talk a little bit about health. Um, how has the pandemic affect this, uh, affected the citizens of Mississippi? Well, we're a small state with about 3 million people. And already, unfortunately, we have over 3,000 who have already died. Most of them, of course, 65 or more African-American. Uh, we have more than 130,000 of those in Mississippi who have been affected by, by the virus. Because our, our uh, because of the lack of uh, health investments in Mississippi, which is a, a legacy of disinvestment, we have all these comorbidities. So as soon as the virus strikes, of course, it just accelerates and raises to our community. Uh, we also have conservative leadership that has advised all Mississippians that they no longer have to wear a mask on a mandatory basis. So I just tell everybody, your mask protects me, my mask protects you. Even though now it's no longer mandatory, we have to keep wearing this and comply with CDC guidelines until we can get a vaccine. You grew up in Yazoo City, Mississippi. When you grew up and went to high school there compared to now, what are the biggest changes over that period of time? And this is what I want to say about Howard. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I'm so indebted to Howard because coming out, come out of that high school, really Howard was the only school that would accept me. And I, I, want, to, I want to tell you why. I, was a, uh, I come from a large family in a town of about 17,000 people. And all of my siblings, I'm the youngest. Uh, I do have a twin sister. She also went to Howard. Only school we applied to. Uh, so uh, we went to a parochial school that closed for lack of money. And we were in our junior year. So my parents had to make the decision to send the twins to the all-black school or the all-white school. Now, if I had a vote, I'd go to the all-black school. I felt more comfortable there. It was convenient. Uh, but, you know, it was, in, it was the white school had better facilities, better laboratory, better books. So my parents, they did the right thing. But, Mr. President, it was... It was the worst time of my life, even today. Every day I was called the N-word. There were 17 black students among a student body of, of 800 white students. So think about it. This is 1968. So every day I'm the N-word. Every day I either had to fight or run from a fight. My teachers embarrassed me in class by spraying me with a high pressure water hose in class. Uh, because of a question that they asked me. So I just could not wait to leave Mississippi. So when the schools merged the next year, I was a senior and all the black students came over, but none of the black teachers did. No black teacher was offered a contract. So I had been elected the black president of the senior class. You know, they were dual, white president, black president. Yep. 
So I led a walkout of the black students to protest the fact that none of the black teachers had received a contract. And that, uh, that march was very successful. So successful to my detriment that I was called into the county superintendent's office. And he told me, Mr. Espy, because you led the walkout, we're gonna dock you two GPA grade, two GPA points for every day you are out. And we were out three days. So, so when I'm a senior beginning to apply from college on a 4.0 scale, my GPA as a senior had been docked six points. Mm. So uh, I applied to Howard. And uh, so my, my standardized tests were, were pretty good. So Howard said, so what's the problem? Why is your GPA so low? And uh, I work at the admissions office at Howard, and I made them understand Jim Crow, Mississippi, 1971 Mississippi, and what we did to lead the walk out and why I was penalized. And they said, we understand. Come on. Come on to the capstone. Come on to Howard. We understand uh, you, were, you were penalized, disadvantaged, victimized. We understand systemic racism. This is an academically uh, outstanding university, but here you will be comfortable. Here nobody's gonna call you the N-word unless it's in a different context. No one's gonna spray you with a high pressure water extinguisher and nobody's gonna dock your GPA for protesting. Uh, uh, so, so look, uh, Howard was my first choice. My first choice of my twin sister, I was there from from uh, 1971 and graduated 1975, uh, it was it was great. And I, I'm just so indebted that Howard University listened to my story, let me explain why my GPA was so unusually low uh, and uh, it just beckoned me on to the capstone. And, and once you were here, what types of experiences you had in terms of the types of activities you participated in, the people you interacted with that really formed a lot of your political view, because you would go on to law school subsequent to that, but I would imagine that you left here um, from a kind of springboard and from a platform of some self-actualization that you just described, some agency, and what gave you that agency? I, I wanted to leave Mississippi. I had to leave Mississippi. It's just, uh, you, you know, I figured I would never come back here, although I did, obviously. Uh, and I wanted to go to a place where I felt comfortable. But Howard now, at that time, this is 1971, 1972. So it was, a, it was a hotbed of activism, and this is a, in a good way. Uh, the uh, the anti-Vietnam movement was going on. It looked like America was going to lose that conflict, but it, it had not yet been formally ended. We had the, um, the zenith of the Black Power movement. We had Shirley Chisholm, you know, making her bid uh, for presidency of the United States. Richard Nixon uh, was then in office. Watergate had, had not yet happened, but I was very, very, very politically oriented. So I did, I did two things, actually. I took a lot of classes in political science. I remember a lot of, one teacher was called uh, uh, Abdul Kalimat. And uh, that was a beautiful resident name, alliterative, but he taught me about social protest. And the things that I did in Mississippi could be widened as long as it was peaceful. Uh, also, I, um, I went the conventional route. I, um, I stood for student government office. Like Kamala Harris, 11 years after me, she ran for, for freshman representative of the Liberal Arts Student Council. I ran and won the office of treasurer of the Liberal Arts Student Council. Uh, it was the largest student body, was school in at Howard at that time. We had the largest budget, and the president of the LESC was also the president of the uh, concert board. So I was able to learn contracts and negotiating with uh, agents of artists to come to, to appear at Crampton Auditorium. And I went to L.A. and New York. Uh, negotiating contracts. I learned all of that at Howard. I also learned that it was very difficult to be elected. I had to have a campaign manager. I had to have a formal platform. I had to have signs and organization. And I learned that in 
all of these things uh, compose the predicate for what I'm doing now. Right, no, excellent. And, and so, I, just to get back to Mississippi, you then moved back to Mississippi after law school. Why? What, what drew you back to a place that obviously had given you so much difficulty and put up so many barriers to your success? Being honest with you, it was the death of my father. So it was, it was a family issue. Uh, when I left Howard, I received um, a full scholarship to law school in California. So I love California, love, love the West, love the warm weather, I love, love the ocean. And I tended to stay there, but in my, in my third year, my father died. So um, we have a family business, uh, which, uh, which was the largest business in Mississippi at that time. Uh, my grandfather also founded a hospital, the first black hospital for black citizens in 1924. He had a newspaper with 100,000 subscribers. So we sort of had a family legacy that beckoned me back to Mississippi, but honestly, it was because my father died. So once I uh, returned to Mississippi, I uh, took the bar exam. <clears throat> Excuse me. I raised this because in Mississippi in 1978, when I took it, uh, when you, there was only one state-sponsored law school, which obviously I did not attend. And when you graduated from Ole Miss Law School, they gave you a diploma. They gave you your bar license at the same time. So when those of us who didn't go to Ole Miss, when we returned to take the bar exam, the pass rate was 3%. 3%. And when I took it, there was no bar reviews because the pass rate was so awful. So I actually took the course. I passed it the first time because the education I received at Howard at my law school, I passed it. I began working with the indigent. Then I began to run for office. I was the first black assistant secretary of state, first black assistant attorney general, first black member of Congress since reconstruction, only African-American to ever become secretary of agriculture and ran for the Senate 18 months ago and got 47%. So all of this based on my experiences at Howard and at my law school. Right. And in, in Mississippi, the preparation for you to go to the cabinet of Bill Clinton uh, was clearly robust. As you look at agriculture, and especially as we talk about the trade deficit and tariffs, et cetera, I would imagine that this is a, a significant issue for Mississippi. What is your perspective on uh, the current White House administration's view on tariffs, on agriculture, and the trade deficit? I wrote an article about this uh, recently. It's, it's called, uh, Be Careful What You Ask For. And by that title, what I was saying was that, um, you know, I don't believe, I don't believe in tariffs. Uh, tariffs. Tariffs are taxes, and they are, they're uneven. I don't think we need those in America because of our technological advantages uh, in, in farm country, because of the information systems we have now. Uh, we can uh, competitively price and sell our products around the globe as long as the trading rules are fair uh, and, they're, and they're equal. So my point in writing that article is that when our president a couple of years ago imposed a tariff on steel and aluminum to China to curry favor politically with the voters in this 2020 presidential election, uh, China turned around and they imposed a retaliatory tariff on agriculture. China used to be the number one soybean market for Mississippi farmers who grew soybeans. And we lost that market in a nanosecond to Brazil, which also grows pretty good soybeans, although they're lower priced than ours. So if the rules are fair, if the, if the market is equal, we can outcompete anyone. We don't need the distractions. Uh, we don't need uh, uh, the inequality of a tariff input, just making things better. So when China turned around and imposed those tariffs on our soybean farmers, automatically they went bankrupt. The tariffs lay in the fields, you know, un unharvested. And the president had to rush in with a supplementary package uh, of aid to them to take, to, to fill the vacuum that they were getting from their own productive activities. And that money came from the American taxpayers 
increasing the deficit. The deficit is financed by the purchases of our, our treasury bills, most of which is purchased from China. Completely ironic. Right. And, and, and the president has spoken about supplementing farmers' income um, with different programs. Do you think that that has been adequate enough to close the deficit that those farmers have been um, experiencing? No, because we never, we never, we never reclaim the market. The, the market we lost to Brazil and others, and it's not just soybeans, it's rice and, and a myriad of uh, poultry. The Mississippi's number one cash crop is poultry and the number three cash crop are, are soybeans. And so we're losing this market all around the world because of the unfair and politically motivated uh, action on his part to curve favor with the industrial states because of this 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 race that we're in another another three weeks and uh, right. it was wrong to do it it was very costly to do it and the farmers are still hurting particularly the African American farmers the hearings for the um, recently nominated Supreme Court uh, justice uh, are taking place um, as we speak and as you look at that process um, what are, do you have any concerns about uh, the Senate taking that up um, now prior to the election versus uh, waiting for the outcome of the presidential race to then decide, or even the Senate for that matter? Of course, uh, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a power grab. Uh, it's a rush to uh, put in someone uh, on the Supreme Court who will be a, uh, hopefully for them, they, they think, a lock solid vote against health care. And they want they want um, Justice Barrett on the Supreme Court bench to be there in time for the uh, November 10th hearing. Uh, that will be an appeal from Texas to uh, eviscerate the Affordable Care Act. So I think that it's uh, it's a wrong-headed move on the part of the Senate, the Republicans in the Senate, and our president. You know, when Justice Ginsburg died, her dying wish, the wish on her deathbed, was a very reasonable wish. And it was simply that her successor not be nominated until the new, the next president had been inaugurated. And here in Mississippi, we've already started voting. They already started voting since September 21st. And so those voters have no say in who's going to be uh, uh, put on the uh, Supreme Court bench. So I think it's uh, it's wrong. Uh, it's uh, it's contrary to what they did with the previous Obama. Nominee, they just stopped it, and uh, it's just wrong. But but we know why. It's because she's of conservative bent. Uh, the president wants her to be in office. If he challenges the presidential election, and it and it goes up to the Supreme Court. But more than that, the number one reason is because of coverage for pre-existing illness, the Affordable Care Act continuation, and uh, within the ACA, Medicaid expansion that Mississippi needs would be offered. And that's why they're doing it so fast, rushing. They should wait. Yeah. Well, e elections matter. And obviously, the 2016 election was extremely um, critical uh, to the nation. I think while we have focused on the Supreme Court in this conversation, and I think we, we will be throughout the course of the nomination of this new justice, the reality is the president has had his legacy will be the number of judges that he's put on the bench throughout the federal system. And so when people say they're not going to go to the polls because they don't have the ideal candidate, uh, it concerns me. And I, and I try to talk to young people about that all the time. What message do you have uh, as we are on the precipice of an yet another election for the young people who will hear this and will listen, or for that matter, uh, the Howard uh, community, what message do you have as we get into this election and as it pertains to your own uh, candidacy? I, I speak to them every day in Mississippi, and I've even spoken to them from Howard by, uh, by digital means, by Zoom. And, and um, for those of them who, um, who have concern for history, I can just raise the names of Medgar Evers, who was shot in the back uh, as the uh, head of the NAACP in Mississippi, shot in the back by a coward as he was entering his home to kiss his own children after a day of registering African-Americans to vote. Fannie Lou Hamer, who uh, ran for Congress 
1964, the same seat that I won in 1986. She ran in 1964, and I'm standing on her shoulders because decades before, she knew there was no way that she could ever ever win. But nonetheless, she was, she was courageous, and she was fearless, and she ran anyway for the right to vote. And Vernon Damer, uh, uh, an African-American here in Mississippi whose truck was blown to smithereens by the Ku Klux Klan because he registered African-Americans to vote in the 60s. Those three names and a pantheon of others, you know, a myriad of others, all sacrificed, bled, toiled for the right to vote. So I'll just say to uh, the millennials and the Gen Zs, just like I'm standing on their shoulders, you are as well. But it's more than that. You have to vote in your own self-interest. Uh, if you have a car and it backs out of your driveway and it hits a pothole, so maybe the mayor that you vote for will have an interest in fixing that pothole. The college that you go to, uh, the tuition might be too high. So we might have someone in the federal government like I did when I was a congressman. I voted for the Howard University supplemental budget every year, and I will continue to do that as a senator. And so then when you graduate in Mississippi, and you might think that there are pastures that are greener somewhere else, I want to make sure that there are job opportunities right here for you, uh, where you can uh, you can uh, apply your skills that are commensurate with your training. So all of these things are things that we should remind uh, our young voters that please don't take for granted. You have to vote because the only way to really change things materially is to do that. Well, Secretary Espy, we, we thank you for your courage, your conviction. Uh, you're a true son of Howard, and you certainly are representing us in the best way possible. We wish you well, and we wish you the best of luck uh, on election night uh, on November 3rd. And uh, please know that you always have a home here at Howard University. Thank you. Now, at the, at the law school, they have something called the SP Food Prize. And uh, I'm a lecturer there on uh, agriculture and food systems. So thank you so much, and go Bisons. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. My guest today was Mike Espy, the former Secretary of Agriculture and Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate in Mississippi. I'm Dr. Wayne Frederick. Please join me next time on The Journey. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.